Hello there, my name is Fred Berkey. I am with the University of Florida IFAS. I'm an extension agent in Martin and St. Lucie County. My program is Florida Yards Neighborhoods, which is an environmental education program to teach you, the general public, how to better take care of your environment. I have a guest here today, a very good friend of mine, and he is the uh, naturalist. Natural from, Resource Extension okay, agent. Okay, I got it right. Uh, from St. Lucie, Lucie County. <laughs> And his, one of his expertise areas is actually water, water quality, quantity, sure. everything to do with water. Very good to have you here, Ken. What we're gonna talk about today is water harvesting. Well, thank you for having me on your show, Fred. We have a lot of information to share with people about water and water harvesting. Well, actually, I think probably the first question, obviously, is what is water harvesting? Well, pretty much water harvesting is any way people can f find ways to store and harvest water on property. How do they collect it? Um, how do they store it? And what do they do with that collected water? So um, during the program today, we're going to talk all about that. Well, that's great. Tell us exactly, I mean, one of the problems that we have is we're using a lot of water. Yeah. Just exactly how much water do we use in the United States today? Well, actually, the numbers are pretty staggering. And I don't realize that, you know, I don't know if people realize, but we use about 26 billion gallons of fresh water every day in the U.S. Holy and that is cat. a lot of water. Yeah. Well, put it on a per capita or a you know, personal basis. How much water do you and I or the average person use on a daily basis? Well, research shows that people use about 80 to 100 gallons of water per day. Um, uh, and that's per person. So, you know, that's, I don't realize that I use that much, but I guess what the statistics say is between 80 and 100 gallons of water. I'll be done. Now let's put it another way. How much rainfall do we get in Florida? I know we get a lot, but how much do we get in our area here? Well, you know, the interesting thing about Florida and rain is sometimes we have too little rain and sometimes we have too much. You know, we either we have Tropical Storm Fay coming through, creating flooding throughout part of the community, or we have drought during part of the year. Uh, but on average, we get about five foot plus or minus you know, and let's go back a little bit now. I know that we're using a lot of this water, you know, per person. Uh, how much of this water is actually used like inside the house and outside the house for landscaping? Well, certainly we have different purposes. Inside the house, people will be using water, of course, for drinking. They'll be using water for watering the indoor plants and showering, washing clothes and things like that. Um, and then outside, of course, people sometimes have an irrigation system where they will be using water in their irrigation system. Um, they might be watering for landscape and, and sure. wildlife that's attracting, you know. So we're actually using much more water outside because of the landscaping situations that we have. Probably. Yeah, that is true. And that's why um, South Florida Water Management District would like to start exploring ways for people to help consume less water in the landscape outside. Yeah, I think that we're seeing that, of course, South Florida Water Management and residents themselves, this is becoming a really, really big problem in well, South Florida. Sure, and you know, using drinking water to irrigate landscape plants doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense. It creates a lot of um, problems. We have to use energy to clean the water. We have to pump the water up from the aquifers. We have to sterilize and clean the water up for people to drink it. And it just doesn't make a lot of sense to um, use drinking water in the landscape. So using alternative yeah. sources of water is a good idea. Well, and I think one of the problems that we have, I mean, I think you mentioned, or if you didn't, we get about how much water per year in the area? What was it? Oh, around five foot, you know, plus or minus a few inches. Holy there. cat, you're talking. Yeah, it's a lot. But you know, if you're in certain areas where it floods quite often, you might have water, yeah. considerably more water than that. Well, then why are we concerned about having proper irrigation facilities, in other words, systems. I mean, well, we certainly don't want to use more water than's necessary. Sometimes when we use too much water in the irrigation, um, the, the grass in our turf, you know, in, in the lawns, yeah. the roots tend to grow very high and they don't search deep for the, for the water and it just kind of weakens the grass. So really using the right amount of water is a better idea than using too much. Well, also, I think that we don't get this water on a regular basis. Correct. We have times of the year that we get a lot more uh, than and, other. And really, it's a good idea for people to have grass that has deep roots so that when we do have times of very little water out there in the landscape, that the roots are down there tapping the water sources deeper in the soil rather than just having, you know, roots right at the surface. And also, there's a problem with something called thatching, which um, if you've ever walked on turf that's thatched, 
Um, it's kind of like walking on sponge. It's, oh yeah, I've, I've noticed yeah, that. And, and okay, and that's from too much water? You yeah, think? and what happens is the root system and a lot of the plant material is actually up on the surface of the ground. Well, I know that we're all concerned about conservation, but who in reality is really the ones, are the ones that really need to be worried about this? Everybody. Yeah. Everybody needs to be worried about water. And um, you can't really just blame one industry. You can't say, you know, one industry consumes more water than the other or, or one neighborhood consumes more water than the other. It's pretty much everybody's responsibility to do what they can to conserve water. All right, and I hear the buzzword storm water runoff. Yeah. And of course, tell me what that is. Well, we do have an issue with stormwater runoff in St. Lucie County and the rest of the Treasure Coast. And uh, for the most part, um, the community is fairly flat. And for, for many of us, we might notice that we have ditches that lead out to swells, that right. lead out to canals, that eventually lead out to the Indian River Lagoon. So the practices that you are undertaking on your landscape, whether you're fertilizing or using pesticides out there or you know, even dog droppings, you know, all of that stuff. When you have rainwater coming down, um, all that stuff washes into the, um, into the swales and ditches yeah. and eventually makes it into canals and makes its way down into the Indian River Lagoon. So you're talking about the water that's coming off of the impervious surfaces and then going down through the system into the... Correct. Uh, when you have um, too much rain coming down into a driveway or yeah. maybe too much rain coming down into a lawn, um, and creating an excess water issue there. It just washes everything right into the ditches. So you're, you're worried about my little two pound dog? I mean... I'm sorry, I do get a lot of dog, dog do complaints, I do, I have to... Do you really? Yeah, I okay. do have a lot of people I, I'll be very careful. Well, and also, you know, people also don't think it's very courteous when, when they see people out there walking That's their dogs. That's actually true, and, yeah. You know, they're just, the yeah. droppings are everywhere. Just clean it up. Oh, I, yeah, I do. I walk around with those little bags. Yeah, it's a good idea. Yeah. Well, what are some of the techniques that we can do for water conservation on an individual basis? Oh, there's so much that you can do. First of all, plant the appropriate plants. Plant, use plant material that does not require a lot of water. Um, in my landscaping at home, I use a lot of cactus plants that store water. You know, it does a really yeah. good job. A lot of native plants also do a good job of, of um, using the appropriate amount of water. When you start dealing with some of the, the non-native plants, that's usually when you're having to do a little bit more maintenance, using a little bit more water sometimes. Well, I think, too, that people don't realize is that when you're planting native plants, you still have to plant them the same way you would a regular exotic plant. Certainly. It's just that once they're established, they really don't need much water at all. So Correct. that's a very good point. And you know, another thing is there are also plants that are non-native plants, um, various cultivars of different species of plants, that can also be low maintenance. Just because it's not a native doesn't necessarily mean that it's not going to be good in your landscape. You just have to talk to your extension agent and know your plants. Well, you know, some of these things we're talking about, and we're going to be talking about more. How much water do you think we could actually save? Do you think we could save enough to... Uh, take up the deficit or what we need for actual irrigation? Well, let me give you one more number that I read in one of the um, University of Florida's publications. On a, on a 1,000 square foot roof and a one inch rainfall event, it, it is possible to harvest up to 625 gallons of water. Now, um, is that in a typical rainfall? Or is one inch is very common in the summertime. Yeah, okay. You know, we get those two o'clock rains that usually last 15 minutes or so. Um, that might be enough for that one inch rain event and you can cer certainly harvest almost 625 gallons of water. Yeah. Well, I know that some of these techniques that you're going to be talking about have been around for many, many years. How far back in history can we actually acknowledge that there have been these systems? Thousands of years and I have read some information that shows that they were finding them in ruins about six th that were about 6,000 years old. So um, they have remnants of cisterns that really? um, the Chinese yeah. um, were using. So. Uh, Pretty much as long as people have been cultivating plants and farming and have been living um, you know, in, in family situations and communities, um, they've pretty much been harvesting water. I'll be done. It's a lot easier also because uh, the olden days, you know, if you were living in a small community, it would take a lot of, a lot of work to bring buckets of water or pails of water. Oh, sure, so they back. could just have one place where they'd have abund yeah, so abundance they have, of water. Um, yeah. Ken, what type of water actual containers do you use for harvesting? Well, there are many different options out there. Probably the easiest thing that people can use is a 55-gallon blue plastic food grade quality drum. And of course, the extension office um, and the rain barrels that we're making, that's what we use. Well, I know that you've been very instrumental in starting this in South Florida, uh, and you use it quite a bit. 
Actually, can you go through exactly how you do it? In other words, once you get the, where do you get the barrel? How do you, you know, drill it and so forth? Well, would you like me to describe the, the process that yeah, your wonderful you assistant Pat will be yes, going through? Yes, yes, we'll have her writing the barrel. Very good. Uh, the very first step is to go ahead and drill a hole in the top. And basically all you do is you just draw the outline of the, um, of the downspout and then you drill little holes um, and then you just kind of connect the dots and you'll remove that piece of plastic and that will be the entrance for the downspout to go into the top of the rain barrel. Um, the next step in the process is to drill a hole for the overflow and also for the spigot. And basically what you'll do is you'll have a 15, 16 inch drill bit. Sometimes I have to use a one inch drill bit, but for the most part, um, people are using 15, 16 inch drill bit. Just drill the two holes and um, those pieces of plastic will be removed and then you just slowly screw in um, the spigot and the overflow. That sounds pretty easy. Is it, it is really that easy? easy? Well, you know, the only thing that people really need to keep in mind is um, the actual location, the site location where they're going to be placing the rain barrel. If they're going to um, have it in a certain location on the property, you know, how does the downspout go into the top of the rain barrel? Um, do they want a spigot facing in a certain direction? You know, would it be um, a problem if they had it facing one wall instead of another? Oh, I see. So one yeah. placement of the overflow and the spigot is important. Uh, also, um, you know, are they going to want to hook up more than one barrel? Um, people might want to start off with one rain barrel, but then sometimes people so want to hook up multiple. So you can put these together? Correct. I'll be doggone. Okay. Now, if you do you have an overflow on this? Uh, you will have an overflow, and the nice thing about that is, you know, you will store 55 gallons of water pretty quickly. Yeah. In fact, now you mentioned something. Now, you said that you cook the gutter into the barrel. Yes. How about if you don't have a gutter? Well, the nice thing about that is you can use rain barrels for homes without gutters as well. Um, you'll probably want to put the rain barrel somewhere like in a trough where, um, where all the water, where comes, the water comes down. And basically all you do is you just cut a hole in the top of the rain barrel. Just take the top off. Just take the top off. And what I've done is I've used hardware cloth, which is kind of uh, like chicken wire, you know, with a smaller mesh, and a little bit of window screen. Now, how do you filter uh, the water that's going in? I mean, is there something at the top of the gutter system? Or? Yeah, there is. Um, there's actually something called a gutter strainer. Let's say that you have um, an oak tree or something that's hanging over the roof of the house um, and you might have leaves that are coming down. Um, sometimes leave build, you know, leaves will build up in the gutters. Um, you can put gutter strainers up that will actually block the leaves oh, from getting I down see. into um, the rain barrel itself. Now, I know that a lot of people, particularly in our area, we get a lot of mosquitoes. How do you yeah. take care of that? Well, the nice thing about these particular barrels that we're using is the tops, you know, they have a little tiny rim around the top. Um, there's actually little holes um, poked into the top of that so the, the water will not pool in the actual top of the rain barrel. But also the barrels will be fairly sealed up. Uh, when people take my rain barrel class, we do give them some plumber's putty. So when the, um, uh, the spigot goes down into the top, into the top of the rain barrel, um, they can just kind of seal that up with a little plumber's putty. And um, also we'll give people mosquito dunks, um, which is a little... Mosquito dunks? Mosquito dunks, <laughs> yeah. And the nice thing about that is you can buy them at Home Depot, Lowe's, pretty oh, much really? any garden center. Okay. And they come in a six pack. And basically what a mosquito dunk is, it looks like a little donut. It's round uh, and it's made of something called BT, Bacillus thuringiensis, which is a natural soil borne bacteria that um, kills off midge and mosquito larvae. So this with no is, impacts on plants and people. Okay, so it's not the typical insecticide. This no. is something. Okay. This is kind of a natural product, oh. and um, you know you can buy a, a whole kit full, a whole package full of mosquito dunks, but really people for a 55-gallon container only need a little, a little tiny bit of that. So kind of break it into quarters and put it in. Now we talked about the different types of containers. Mm -hmm. Exactly, what's the difference between a cistern and a rain barrel? Well, that's a good question because sometimes people use those terms interchangeably. When I think of a rain barrel, I think of something that's going to be above ground um, that you'll actually see like in somebody's front or backyard. A cistern uh, typically is a little bit larger and sometimes it's made out of concrete. I have seen plastic ones, but sometimes they're made out of concrete and they're usually sunk down into the ground. Okay, but of course in other parts of the world it could be anything, right? You know, I've actually been to the Galapagos and I've traveled quite extensively around the world. And when you go to many islands, like the Galapagos, which is a desert island in the sure. middle of nowhere, yeah. all the buildings on the island will have cisterns and, and rain barrels. They'll have the rain barrels on the roofs, um, they collect what little rainwater comes down, and um, since it's on the roof, it gets gravity fed to the buildings, they use it for plumbing. Well, you know, I keep thinking about it. I had the opportunity to go to Bermuda, mm -hmm. and they are required by sure. law to have cisterns underneath their houses 
to collect all of the rainwater. Wouldn't that be great if we had a rule like that here I in Florida? Th I am so amazed that we don't. Yeah, I and think actually, it's essential. I, th I think that we're kind of moving that way. You know, there are some concerns about the weight of water, for example. You know, people are worried about the structural sure. properties of holding water on site. Sure. Um, for example, a 55-gallon container full of rainwater will weigh about 400 pounds. So sometimes people might be using storage, um, plastic storage containers. Sometimes they use those plastic trash bins, you know, yeah, the pla plastic sure. containers. They're just not strong enough to hold 400 gallons of, or 400 pounds of water, and they can burst at the seams. Of course, that brings up one of the questions that I had later on, we'll just cover it now. Is there a problem, like in a hurricane, for these containers, are they gonna blow over? And I think you sort of answered it, that much water, I don't believe so. Well, you know what I did with my rain barrel during the hurricanes in 2004? I actually emptied them out Oh. And I cleaned them out pretty good, and I put it in my shower stall at home and filled it up with potable water. Oh. I didn't use that water to drink, but what I did is I used it to prime my toilets sure. and to use for other non-potable uses around the house. Well, that brings up a, a really good uh, question. What can this water be used for? I mean, we know we can use it for irrigation. What are some of the other things that you could use it now, for? Now, there are places around the, water, uh, around the world where they do use this water for drinking. I don't think it's a good idea here in Florida because you know there are problems with uh, you know diseases bacteria well, and, and you like don't that. know what's on the roof yeah either. you don't know what's on the roof so um, pretty much any non potable non drinking water use uh, you might want to fill up a watering can and water your plants with that hooking up a soaker hose you oh yeah that. now that's you a very good use sure um, I've got one person who takes my rain barrel classes who's actually put several of them together and sunk them down into the ground and has a little gravity pump or some sort of a sure pump. that brings it out to the top. Yeah, I'll be darned. So uh, people now, are getting pretty ingenious with yeah, this. Yeah. Well, we've talked about all of the fuzzy feeling good things. Are there any problems? In other words, are there things that you might get into that you don't want to with uh, cisterns and rain barrels? Well, you know, we did talk about the um, the weight issue, and certainly if you have kids, um, you would not want them playing on a rain barrel because if they were to crawl up on it and you know pull it over, having 400 pounds. Ooh, of water falling yeah. on a kid could crush that kid. So um, uh, it's a good idea to just secure the rain barrel if you have kids around the house. Well, what about, are there any restrictions, say from county or? Uh... Uh, that is a good idea. Um, there are some municipalities that have no restrictions on the use of rain barrels. Um, there are some others that require rain barrels to be in the back of the building instead of the front. Okay. Um, so you just need to check with your local code enforcement office. Certainly if you're in a homeowners association, you'd want to check with your homeowners board or, or an architectural re review board if you have one. That's a good point. I know where I live that I would probably definitely want to go and check and make sure that they were allowed. But this brings up a thing too. I mean, some of these really become quite beautiful. I mean, people will decide that they will paint all over them. Is this something that's widely done? And there, are there any things that, that, that a person has to do when they paint it? Well, one of the things that we do here is we offer rain barrel painting um, contests. So let's say oh, really? I have six months worth of people going through my course. Um, one way that I can do follow-up with them is they have to submit pictures of their decorated, you know, installed rain barrel, and then I have a committee review the pictures, and then they get a gift card. Um, the best one oh, is selected excellent. for a gift card. Sounds like your programs are excellent. Now, how, well, thank you, Fred. how would the program be aware when you're having one? Uh, we do advertise. I have a newsletter. We also advertise um, in the newspaper. Um, we try to get word of, of mouth out. Of course, we don't have an advertising budget. Uh, but you have a good website, too. You yeah, might we, we tell have, where that is. And um, the St. Lucie County and the Martin County Extension Offices, really right. all the extension offices in the state of Florida, can be found on solutionsforyourlife.com. Okay, very good. Now we're going to switch gears a little bit, and we're going to you know, go a different direction. Still in water and water harvesting, where does our household water come from? Oh, for our drinking water. I'm glad you asked that because... <laughs> Many municipalities are different, but for the most part, um, in our area of Florida, they're getting it from what's called the, um, the Florida Aquifer. And many people may not you know, understand this, they might not know this, but there are actually slow-moving bodies of water under our feet. Sure. We have one body of water called the surficial aquifer, which is not very far deep. Um, and you know, if you have a typical well in your backyard, an old well in your backyard, more than likely you're getting water from the, what's called the surficial aquifer. But most of the municipalities in our area are actually tapping water from something called the Floridan. Which is aquifer. much deeper? It's much deeper. And what'll happen is they'll tap that water, they'll bring it up into the, um, into the municipal system where they'll treat it, 
Um, they have to make sure that it's sterile and potable and drinkable. What they'll do then is they'll, of course, they'll pump it out into the municipal system. People will drink it, and then the waste product will go and be um, collected in the storm uh, in the storm and, system. And I think where I'm trying to get to here is once it's been used mm -hmm. for the different purposes, what happens to it then? Well, it will certainly be used. Um, it'll go into the sewer system and um, be cleaned up, treated as waste. All right, now that's a big thing in South Florida water management right now is the use of what they call reuse or wastewater. Um, Tell us a little bit about that. It's also called gray water. Okay. Um, sometimes that's a word that they're throwing around quite a bit right now. And pretty much what people are doing, um, what municipalities um, are starting to get more involved with, let's say that you have um, um, people are drinking the water, you know, they're of course excreting it and, and going into the sewer system. And what will happen is um, the municipalities will collect that um, and then they'll treat it, not to the point of it being potable, in other words, drinkable, sure. but they'll treat it to make sure that there are no harmful bacteria so and things in it. You're talking about water that's through a toilet. Too, pretty much, right? pretty right. much, yeah. So there's a lot of fecal coliform. I was trying to get away from you using didn't use that. <laughs> but yeah, you know, once it goes into the septic, or you know, into the system where it's treated by, by the municipality, I have a hard time saying that word, um, it can then um, be cleaned up, um, not to the point where it's drinkable, but to the point where it is fairly safe. And, but it needs another system to get back out to people to use an irrigation. Well, I understand that there's a huge amount of this water yeah. Do you have a handle on how much there might be? Or? As much as people drink. I, I wish know, I could give you, as much I as wish they, I could give you numbers. Right. You know, we did talk about, you know, the 80 to 100 gallons a day per person. Yeah, um, and this is what you're capturing. Or yeah, you would. that's, so that's actually, what people consume. Right, so what you're what talking drink, about is the use. water that goes through one of these uh, reclamation areas or a wastewater treatment plant mm -hmm. that we definitely would not want to drink. And then they, they actually go through and they... Uh, they make it more, it's not potable, mm -hmm. but it is usable for, what, irrigation? Correct. It's safe to be pumped back out into irrigation systems to be used in landscaping. But the problem is, it's very expensive for municipalities to do this because essentially they have to have double systems, one for potable water and then another for gray water. So we're seeing some municipalities that are starting to do that in certain areas of their communities. So this is this is expensive. actually right now a lot of water that's just being sent out to uh, tide, really. Well, actually, what happens to it very often is they treat it, um, not to the point of being drinking water, but they'll treat it and then they'll pump it right back down into the Florida aquifer, okay. um, very deep, from yeah, what I understand. Yeah. yeah. So um, But you know, I had Chip Millam on my show not too long ago, and he's with South Florida Water Management, mm -hmm. and I believe he mentioned that were that were there was over 500 million gallons a day of this you know, uh, water coming from Palm Beach, Broward, and Dade counties, just yeah. in those three counties. Yeah. So it is a tremendous amount of water. Are there any guidelines for using it? In other words, do we have any uh, DEP, EPA regulations that actually tie into this? Oh yeah, um, anytime you're using water that's pumped out into any sort of a municipality um, that might be you know, used by people, whether it's in the landscape or inside of people's homes, they have to comply with DEP and EPA um, standards, uh, it's yeah. very important. We need to make sure that um, our government is making sure that our water sources are clean. Oh, absolutely. And I, I, what you're saying is that we can use this, particularly for landscape mm -hmm. use, and we're using so much of the landscape water, I mean water for landscaping anyway. So actually you're saying we could have two faucets on your home. One for the gray water and for, one for outside. Right, and, and one, one for, for the icky water. <laughs> <laughs> one for the potable and one for the icky Right, right. Um, yeah. And I think this is definitely being done. I think in, uh, I think it's St. Petersburg, a lot of the new developments are actually not mandated, but they're allowing them to put more houses per acre if they use this particular type of water. Well, you know, they've had so much development over on that coast that they've actually started running out of water. And when their water is running out, you know, the fresh water sources, they get something called saltwater intrusion. Oh, yeah. And okay. that actually kind of, you know, makes the water non drinkable. Yeah. So um, what they've actually had to start doing in certain areas, I believe Tampa and Hillsborough County is doing this, they actually have to um, turn salt water into fresh water, oh, I, oh, which I is, see. of course, extremely energy. Um, yeah, it takes a huge amount of energy yeah. to do that. Right. But when you don't have any fresh water left and you have a population there, they had no other choice. So really, this reuse water is a new concept. Maybe mm -hmm. not new, but it is a concept where we're water harvesting and yes. using water that normally would just go out to time. And you know, another thing about, you know, 
putting that water that's been treated in the waste system, um, putting that down into the aquifer, they refer to that as aquifer recharge. Oh, okay. Um, because you would not want to have everybody sucking water out of, out of the pool. aquifer <laughs> without putting any more back in there. Yeah. So they, yeah. they do consider that to be in a, um, a very important part of the water cycle here in Florida. What do you see as the, the future for reuse water and I mean, just bringing in a perspective, all of these different water harvesting techniques. I think it's going to be the way of the future. I think that we're going to be seeing this um, probably mandated in the future. Yeah, I agree. Um, as more and more developments are coming in, uh, we're going to definitely have to start finding alternative water sources. Um, water is a huge commodity here. Yeah. Um, you know, people still get affordable water uh, when they open up their tap, and you know, it might cost thirty dollars a month for their you know minimal sure. water bill, but. You know, I think we're going to start seeing changes in that. I think um, the cost of water is going to start going up. People go and they spend, you know, a dollar or two to get a little tiny bottle of water right. when they can go and get tap water that's, you know, Absolutely just free. a couple of pennies. Plus the fact that the bottle itself is, is a commodity that's very difficult to get rid of once you know, it's put in the landfill. You know what I do, and I don't like to tell people this very often, but I might go and buy a bottle of that water. You know, if I'm out and sure. about and I'm thirsty, I'll go drink that, but I'll save the bottle. And I'll then, bring it home, fill it up with tap water, and then, and then refrigerate it, it at home. Well, you know, Ken, you have done an excellent job going all through this. Is there anything we missed? Well, you know, there are extension offices throughout all of South Florida right yes, now that are good. working with rain barrel programs. Certainly here in, in St. Lucie County, we've got rain barrel programs. And we do in Martin. Martin County. Um, Palm Beach County, I believe, um, they do rain sure. barrel courses. Sure. Um, Alyssa Dodd was down there, but she's recently left the system. So I, I would imagine that Master Gardeners down there are doing the program. Uh, Miami-Dade, we've got an extension agent down there who's doing the program. Yeah. So pretty much all over the east coast of Florida. Well, see, see what you've created? Oh, that's not me. It's a, it's a good idea that you know we've all kind of put our hands on. Well, I really want to thank you thank for you being friend. on the program. You did an excellent job, and Thanks. we'll certainly love to have you back. I think, you know, I usually keep a, a, a tip of the day, but, you know, it's the same tip we come back with. You have this huge, wonderful facility, University of Florida IFAS. We have extension agents in all of the counties. We've talked about water reuse. We've talked about rain barrels. You need to contact your, your uh, extension office and take advantage of the wonderful programs that we have. So thank you for being here, and I'll see you later.